flour and that is leavened. Uh, but the trick is, in order for a bread to be a bread, it actually doesn't have to be any of those things. I'm very open-minded when it comes to how you define bread. To me, a bread is any food that you have that's a majority flour and that is somehow cooked. Uh, so flour, that's one of your sort of first questions and we'll dive more into it later. Uh, but a flour can be anything that has a seed nut or berry that is ground or pulverized uh, into a fine powder. So wheat flour is what we'll mostly be talking about today, uh, but there are all sorts of other flours. I had in my kitchen just sort of waiting around for me, things like almond flour, which you can put in baking, things like corn flour, things like rye or rice, uh, all sorts of different flours. Wheat flour is the main thing that we'll be looking at. Uh, wheat flour comes from the wheat berry, and we'll sort of dive into that. So when we said bread has to be made with flour and somehow cooked, we used wheat flour here. We cooked it. Uh, this instance, we baked this, uh, but there are all sorts of opportunities <laughs> to make uh, breads that can be steamed or boiled rather than baked. Uh, so baking isn't necessarily a part of bread. Then this is a leavened bread. Uh, we'll get into later that there are all sorts of breads that aren't leavened. Uh, so when we say what is bread, then the next, of course the next question is what is good bread? Uh, so if we want to zoom in on my hands, Allison, we'll test this out. Uh, we're trying to multiple camera angles for this. We went very high tech. Uh, that this is the bread I made. Uh, I asked some of you to have a slice of bread that you might have had around your house, uh, whatever it may be. One of my sort of big struggles is that, yes, if you can hold up your bread to the camera, I'm seeing some of them uh, come angle by angle. So when you say, sort of, what is good bread? Uh, it's really important to sort of use your senses. Uh, oftentimes in America, people just sort of eat bread and they don't really think about it. Uh, it's something that they slap ingredients between or they uh, maybe put things on top of, but it's not really a food they give adequate respect in its own. And I think part of that is that we don't have vocabulary, uh, that we don't really understand what is bread. So I'm going to invite us to sort of take a bread journey with the bread you have, uh, and I'll do it with this bread as well, and talk about with all of your senses what do you see, hear, smell, feel with this bread? So first, let's begin with what is oftentimes going to be sort of the first question of bread is smell. Uh, oftentimes, especially when you're baking, you'll be smelling something way before uh, you are going to be seeing it or feeling it. Uh, so when you smell something, I'm going to invite you, uh, humans don't have really good senses of smell. Our noses aren't all that great. So, I'm going to go back to my face camera. Uh, when you smell something, uh, it's important to really get in there. Uh, you only really smell something once you get it to the sort of close part of your nose. So, it's your own slice of bread. I invite you to give it a sniff. And if people want to unmute themselves or type something in the chat, what is it that you smell when you smell your bread? And if Allison, you want to read aloud anything you hear, you read? Sourness. Sourness. Good. Ha happiness. Joy. <laughs> also important. Earthiness. Earthiness. Warmth. Warmth. Mine is a little tangy and with a rosemary smell. Ooh. Oh, fancy. Excellent. So we're getting, so oftentimes when I teach this class and I ask somebody- Sweetness, moisture, sorry I interrupted. It's all right. <laughs> when I ask somebody to smell their bread, uh, one of the first responses I get is oftentimes that it's yeasty, uh, which is true. It smells like yeast, but not very specific. Uh, if we were smelling a glass of wine right now, people would all have all sorts of words to talk about it, that they would say that it smells like raspberries or rosemary, uh, like cherries, like tannins all sorts of stuff. When we talk about bread, oftentimes people lack that vocabulary, in part because we just haven't sort of done the work. If you have a slice of sort of crusty bread like this, I invite you not just to smell the crumb, this sort of soft inside piece, but smell the crust as well. Smelling 
the bottom of the crust for me smells really caramelized, sort of dark, uh, smells a little bit meaty. When I smell the inside, it does smell sort of sweet and tangy. Uh, it smells in a way that reminds me of sort of living things, of yogurts and other fermented foods. When I smell the top, I have to be careful because there's some flour on top here. Don't snort too much of it. Uh, you can smell the sort of almondy, nutty flavor to it. So there are all sorts of smells you get from this. Second off, uh, if we want to go back to the hand camera, uh, what do we see when we look at this slice of bread? Uh, what are the things that are sort of notable or noticeable? Mm -hmm. Holes, yeah. So we got holes here. So when you look at sort of what is the geology of a slice of bread, um, you have the inside part here, which is called the crumb, and then the outside that's called the crust. So this has a sort of medium crumb. Uh, we've got some large holes like this, we've got some smaller holes, we've got some variation. Um, you can see that there's some sort of fluffiness to there. So we've got holes. What else do people see? Webbing. Webbing. Yeah, you can see the strength there. Uh, so this made with wheat flour has gluten in it. Um, gluten is a sort of strong protein that is going to be really creating the structure and the framework of your bread. You also, see? hard crust. A hard crust, yeah. So you can see here that you've got some variation, that it goes from this sort of dark color down here up into the crumb. You can see it's a fairly thick crust uh, that has some substance to it. Now, you might have a slice of white bread in your hands right now that's just got a sort of shellacked on brownness to it, but this instead has some real, uh, real thickness, but not the thickest crust in the world. What else do you see? Color variation. Yeah, color variation. Um, one thing you'll see is that this was made with a mix of white and whole wheat flour, so it's uh, got some color variation in it. It's also not blindingly white because it was made with unbleached flour. Um, that gives it sort of its natural sort of yellow tannish color that you should have in wheat before you bleach things out. Other things you see? On the top here, you'll see that I dusted it with flour uh, when it was proofing in the basket that I it was rising the basket it had. You also see color variation, some darkness here. Uh, we've got a, a uh, Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore, yeah. <laughs> you can see that we've got sort of a lip here and we've got variation that when. Those are Jesus. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. You can see a lot of things in bread. Uh, so this scoring pattern, I cut this bread. Uh, for reasons we'll get into later, but you can see some of the sort of impacts of that here. Anything else people are seeing? All right, let's feel it. Um, so when you feel your slice of bread, uh, <laughs> deliciousness, hopefully you can, you can see the deliciousness, but that's not gonna come in until later. So when you feel your slice of bread, um, so just squishing down this slice of bread, I can feel that it's a little bit wet. It's got some moisture to it, um, that it's something that has uh, spring to it and strength. You might be able to see that when I'm sort of pushing it down, it actually bounces back. Uh, if this was a slice of Wonder Bread, you squish that down, it just sort of goes into a ball and it's going to stick there forever. This has some resilience to it. Also, when I feel it, I can feel the stiffness of the crust. The bottom crust is stiffer than the top crust because it's up against the sort of hotter part of the oven. When we start to feel things, we might also start hearing it. Uh, you oftentimes don't think of bread as something that you're going to listen to, but especially if you squish it down, I can actually hear those little pockets bubbling closed and open again. Yes, we have a spongy color. I think that goes well with what you're seeing. Yeah. Hearing. Super spongy and sort of hearing it, you can easily hear the sort of crunchiness of the crust when you crunch something like this. All right, so we've seen it, smelled it, uh, touched it. Uh, the sort of next step is, of course, uh, to taste it. So uh, if we go back to my head camera, um, when you eat bread, uh, one thing that you'll notice, it's just like eating everything else. When you smell it, and then you want to put it in your mouth, you can have really different flavors uh, from one another. So if you've been patient enough with whatever slice of bread you have, uh, I invite you to now take a bite.
and see what it's like. When you're taking a bite, you're really doing a couple things. Um, not only are you tasting it for the first time, it's touching your tongue, but you're smelling it in a different way. You can have the smells of something enter in your nose from the front, but as you know, your esophagus is also connected to your mouth from the back. So when you're eating something, you're actually releasing some of those smells and they enter up through the back of your nasal cavity and you're smelling them in a different way and sort of hitting different smell receptors up there. You're tasting it for the first time. How does your bread taste? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear. This tastes pretty tangy. Ta oh. Oh. Jinx. Tangy. Somebody typed it in and right when I was saying. It's a tangy comment. So yeah, it's kind of tangy. Um, it actually tastes for me. This one tastes a lot more sour than it smelled, which isn't so uncommon for there to be a sort of difference in terms of what you smell and what you taste in your mouth. Um, this also tastes both tangier and uh, more sour and also has sort of a nuttier flavor to it than it did when I was smelling it. Taking a bite with the crumb versus taking a bite with just crust, you can taste, you can feel a really different thing. Um, you were feeling with your hands before, but now that you're feeling with your mouth, uh, your hands are of course really sensitive, your tongue is even more sensitive. And the sort of inside your mouth is gonna be feeling things in a whole different way than you were feeling them before. Uh, so this, when I put it in my mouth, uh, it's got some substance to it. It's got some structure. Uh, I have to chew it, as you probably saw. Uh, I need to clear my mouth afterwards because it wasn't something that was just gonna sort of disappear like it was cotton candy. Uh, it's something that really had to sort of chew and work through, especially getting the crust in there. I could feel some of the spikiness and some of the sharpness that if I sort of chewed it wrong, uh, it was gonna hurt the top of my mouth. Any other comments that you have from eating this slice of bread? Overall, sort of one of my recommendations is you don't need to eat every slice of bread in your life, taking five minutes, but you should occasionally take five minutes to eat a slice of bread. Uh, only by doing that and only by really paying attention and sort of leaning into what is your bread uh, are you going to be able to start saying, what bread do I want? Uh, there's no perfect bread that is going to be good for all occasions. Usually it's going to be, what sort of bread do I want to make and did I get there? Uh, and only by paying attention to the end product and sort of enjoying and tasting it, do you actually get to see things. We also have a comment that maybe you have an explanation for. Yeah. Mine tastes less sweet than it smells. Interesting. Um, I mean, it could just be a, a situation where this taste of it is going to be sort of overpowered. Uh, sweetness, when you smell sweetness, uh, you know, sweetness is actually a flavor on your tongue. Your tongue can taste uh, salt, sour, sweet, umami, uh, spiciness. Those are the, the flavors you have on your tongue. Your smells are gonna be sort of all the variants of everything else that's in the world. And some of that might just be association, that there are smells that you have that you associate with sweetness, uh, even though you're not actually like, tasting and getting that sweetness in itself. Uh, so you might be just getting a scent of something uh, that then when you taste it, it's not, not tickling your tongue in that way. Anything else? In terms of volume, speed, and quality, are we all, good in terms of what we can see right now? I'll wait for a moment. Thank you. I got a shout out, camera work. You also got a shout out for the setup, making Lee Great Getting camera. a lot of work into the setup. <laughs> we can do behind the scenes photos later. <laughs> uh, wonderful, so if everything's working well, that's sort of our first stage, is talking about what is bread and what is good bread. Uh, then the question I'm is, about better than Julia Child. <laughs> I try, I try. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about what makes up bread. Uh, in the United States, if you want to make bread, you can put anything in it and call it bread. We have pretty lax food laws here. Uh, as I mentioned, I apprenticed at a bakery in Paris uh, where we sold a traditional baguette, which is an official designation by the French government that if you're selling a traditional baguette, it is only legally allowed to have four ingredients in it. Those four ingredients are sort of the core ingredients that are going to be in every bread you make. Uh, those ingredients are flour, salt, water, and leavening agents. So I'm gonna walk you through sort of piece by piece what those 
uh, ingredients are and sort of what they mean to you when you're in the store. So as we talked about earlier, uh, there are lots of different types of flowers out there that might be different uh, types of grains, that might be types of nuts. Uh, we're talking about wheat flour here because that's the focus of our class. Uh, we've got a hand cam. Um, these are three types of flour that King Arthur flour, uh, not sponsored by them, but they are a great flour. Uh, they are a flour company that really takes their product seriously. Um, when you look at flowers, there's sort of two big designations that you see. Uh, one of them is going to be whether things uh, are white or whole wheat, and the other is going to be uh, what, whether they, what level of gluten they have. So here we see some of the variation in gluten levels. Uh, on this side with cake flour, we have the lowest gluten. Uh, gluten is a simple protein that starts with these glutenids that are just sitting around in flour when you start off. Uh, I'm go back to my head. Uh, when, <laughs> uh, when you add water to uh, wheat flour with those glutenids, they start to bond together and link up to create these longer chains of a complex protein called gluten. Um, gluten, you've probably heard of with people who are gluten intolerant. Uh, that long chain is a really sort of complicated Thing to have in your gut. Uh, some people can't process it well. Some people can, and that's great because it is delicious and useful. That sort of long chain when you start off, it sort of connects up into these bonds, and as you knead your bread, you are sort of un, uh, unraveling that chain of gluten into these longer strains. So when you guys were saying that you saw these pockets and you saw those strains of that matrices, that's the gluten that you're seeing, where it's gone from just being these long chains to sort of gripping hands with all the gluten around it to make these uh, sheaths and balloons and walls that can make your bread structure. So gluten is what gives you structure and substance, what gives you chewiness. It's the reason why gluten-free breads or breads that are made exclusively with rye flour or corn flour, uh, they don't have that same sort of stretch and pull and chewiness to them. So the more gluten you have in a product, the more of that stretch you're gonna have. So cake flour, pretty easy to think about. Uh, if you have a slice of cake that is super chewy, uh, that's not great. You don't wanna like tear a cake as if it were a bagel or a pizza crust. You want cake that sort of crumbles and falls apart. It needs enough structure to be able to hold itself together, but it shouldn't be chewy. Uh, so cake flour is usually between six and 8% uh, protein or gluten level in it. Next up is pastry flour. I don't have pastry flour at the moment because uh, they're all out at the store. Uh, but pastry flour is usually around 8 to 10 percent gluten level. Um, you can think of pastry flour as something you want to make you know, pastries with, scones, muffins, things that have a little bit more chew uh, but still have the tenderness that you'd be getting in something like cake. Then you have all-purpose flour. Uh, as the name implies, all-purpose is for all purposes. It's around 11% uh, protein, 11% uh, gluten. That's gonna be sort of your go-to flour. If you're buying flour at the store and it doesn't tell you what level of gluten it is, it's probably gonna be an all-purpose flour. It's probably gonna have a range to it. Uh, officially, all-purpose flour is supposed to be 11.7%, all, and all of what King Arthur does is test and make sure that they're actually getting that level. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I like it, is that when you're trying to learn how to bake especially, it's important to take out variables. And if you're buying something like gold metal flour, uh, they can have great variation in the uh, amount of gluten that are in there. Even though they aim to be all purpose, it might be as high as 12 or as low as eight. They're basically just buying sort of the cheapest uh, wheat that they can get on the market, grinding it up with some seasonality, it's gonna have variation to it. So uh, getting nice flour is gonna be helpful when you're learning how to bake to be able to have consistency. Next up, we have bread flour. Uh, bread flour is usually between 12 and 13% uh, gluten. Uh, bread flour is, of course, made for making bread. Uh, it's gonna give you more of that chew, more of that pull. The sort of gluten after that is gonna be uh, high gluten flour, uh, or sometimes called pizza flour. It's usually 14 plus percent gluten. Uh, often it's pretty hot, hard to find those in stores unless it's a specialty store, uh, just because most people aren't working that much with gluten. Uh, also because the way you cook gluten, it starts off with that sort of long tangle of mess. It's got all that sort of spring and form to it when it's really doughy. 
when you bake gluten, it goes from that elastic stage to a semi-elastic stage. And that semi-elastic stage is what gives you that sort of no longer doughy and raw feeling, instead has a pleasant pull and tear to it. Gluten cooks at a pretty high temperature. And in a commercial kitchen, you're getting ovens that are gonna be 1,000 degrees, 1,400 degrees, things that are really hot. And they can cook all that gluten much quicker uh, without burning the outside of whatever you've got than your home oven is. And your home oven's probably only getting to 450 or 500 degrees. So most home chefs aren't gonna be using high gluten flour just because they wouldn't be able to bake all that gluten in there without it starting to feel sort of gummy and chewy and unpleasant in the mouth. So that's the sort of first range of things you've got is in terms of gluten levels. Are there any questions on the world of gluten? Potentially. <laughs> uh, so, why is Wonder Bread so weak? Why is Wonder Bread so weak? Um, so, Wonder Bread, uh, I haven't looked at the ingredients lately, uh, but you'll see that it has a lot more than just, uh, just flour, water, salt, and leavening agent. It has lots of other sort of stabilizer and chemicals in there. One of the sort of pushes for Wonder Bread is that it, uh, it lasts a long time. It's got really good shelf stability. Um, when we talk about gluten, you know, it starts off doughy, you cook it, it goes to that semi-elastic stage. Uh, bread eventually stales uh, somewhere around here. So this is a slice of bread that I, uh, I baked just two days ago. Uh, and its texture is now no longer gummy and gooey. Uh, it's very stiff. And that's in part because it's dried out but it's also in part because the gluten has gone from that semi-elastic stage and it's crystallized and you can sort of feel that and sort of see it in the way it forms. And that crystallization makes it stale. Uh, there are lots of chemicals you can add to something like Wonder Bread to keep it from crystallizing quite so quickly. Uh, and those are gonna be what makes it uh, got the unique flavor that Wonder Bread has. Other questions? So the question is, is all bread the same, but makes but is made different based on different starters? Uh, we'll get to starters soon. Uh, not all breads are the same. Of course, these are sort of four basic ingredients uh, of flour, water, salt, and leavening agents. Uh, but you can easily put in butter and eggs and almond paste and all sorts of other things into a bread to make it the bread that it'll be. Uh, in addition to that, there is the ingredient of time uh, and sort of what you do with it. And once we get into the recipe in the final third of our, our show, uh, we'll talk all about that. And then also, sorry, a couple more came through. Do all flours report the gluten content? No. Uh, no requirement to do so. So most will not tell you. Uh, you're probably looking at a higher quality flour if it's going to go to the trouble of testing and telling you that stuff. Uh, some, rather than telling you a percentage, uh, you will find things that are just labeled as pastry flour or all-purpose, um, and that's probably going to be good enough. And then, what about whole wheat flour? Maybe repeat the question. Whole wheat, what about whole wheat flour is the question. Um, that's the next topic. So here, uh, if you want to zoom in on my hands again, Allison. Um, yeah, although there's more gluten questions. Do you want me to stay on those? Uh, we'll, we'll get back there okay. at the end of flour. Um, and then, but the most important question of all is what are you drinking, Nathan? Uh, just a glass of water. <laughs> gotta, gotta keep hydrated in these tough times. <laughs> uh, so here I have uh, a whole wheat and a white flour. And you can see a color difference between those two. Uh, when we talk about uh, wheat, uh, wheat, as you probably know, is a grass. Uh, it has what is called a berry, which is sort of its seed. Uh, so these are some wheat berries. Wheat has sort of three parts to it. Uh, you might think of it sort of like an orange, where it has this sort of outside hole, uh, which is called the bran. Uh, then it has this sort of sweet part, which is called the endosperm. And then it has a little seed, just like this has a little seed in it, called a germ. And those three things combined and ground together make whole wheat flour. Whole wheat flour is called that because it has the whole of the wheat berry in it. 
nothing's been taken out. Uh, whole wheat flour is what everyone was working with uh, up until sort of the early 20th century, before we had gotten really good sort of sifting mechanisms. Only the very wealthy could afford to have uh, white flour, where they stripped out that germ and that grain um, and sort of took it out with some sort of sieve. Why did they take it out? Um, they took it out because, as you probably know, whole wheat flour, it's got a flavor to it. It's going to taste really weedy. Uh, whole wheat flour is better for you uh, in that the bran uh, has a lot of fiber in it and the germ has a lot of vitamins in it. Um, but anything that's healthier for you is also going to be healthier for uh, pests. So insects and molds find it, it, whole wheat flour much uh, better to be eating than white flour. White flour has just reduced itself to sort of pure sugar. It's just the sort of sweet part of your berry ground up in there. And that pure sugar, you know, sugar is a preservative and it's able to sort of keep going longer and stay on your shelf longer without pests getting into it when you've taken out those healthy bits. Uh, so in addition to flavor, in addition to staying power, it also changes texture. The bran and the germ are going to add some weight to your, to your uh, bread and get it sort of more heft, and that heft is maybe not what you want. Uh, whole wheat cakes can be delightful, but they can also sometimes be difficult. Uh, they're sort of chewy and grindy, uh, and sometimes you want something light and fluffy that's just like straight hit of sugar, and that's what you can get with white flour. So uh, when I bake, I usually do a mixture of white and whole wheat. Uh, White and whole wheat mix well. Uh, there's no sort of difference between the two when you're making adjustments. So based on your personal preference, you can add in more whole wheat or more white. Uh, I usually do about a third whole wheat. A third of whole wheat is sort of enough to add some flavor and some texture without really bogging down my bread and making it super heavy. Um, if you are in the store and you see something that's labeled 100% whole wheat uh, and it's not a hefty German bread that you really got to gnaw at, it's probably not actually 100% whole wheat. Again, American food regulations are pretty lax, uh, and you can label something 100% whole wheat, uh, which just refers to the part of it that is whole wheat is 100% whole wheat, and the rest of it is whatever the rest of it is. So if you're getting a nice sandwich bread at the store that has got a brown color to it, but isn't super heavy, uh, it's probably got some whole wheat in it, but it's probably also going to be colored by molasses or barley malt, or something else that's gonna give it some color and make you feel better about yourself. Uh, if you're baking at home, you can go 100% whole wheat, but you're not gonna get as much uh, rise to it. So that's the big difference between whole wheat and white. Do you wanna go back to our questions? We have, they're pouring in. Pouring in, people love to hear about flour. Um, okay, so do you know anything about ancient grain and its food and content, emmer or icorn? We do. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about, oh, uh, the question was, what's the difference between ancient grains and modern grains? So when you look at wheat, so wheat's a grass uh, that grows wild by the side of the road. You've probably seen wheat when you're driving out in the country. Uh, and that is a naturally occurring grain out there uh, called einkorn. Einkorn uh, is what humans first started sort of plucking those little berries or threshing them, grinding them up and making bread flour. Uh, einkorn's great. It's full of uh, a lot of nutrients. It's got a really big bran on it. Uh, so it's got lots of sort of wholeness to it when you make whole wheat flour out of it. Uh, but not a lot of gluten, it's not a lot of strength. At some point, it hybridized bread with another strain of grass out there, maybe a rye, not sure quite what, but it went into durum wheat. Uh, so durum wheat, you're probably most familiar with when you buy pasta, that oftentimes pasta is made with durum flour. Uh, and it's basically a sort of next step in the evolutionary chain of wheat flours. Uh, it's got slightly more gluten in it, uh, but still pretty flavorful, still uh, got some chew to it. That then got hybridized uh, again with something else and became bread flours that we have today. And there are many, many varieties of bread flours out there. Uh, but only a few of them are usually grown in the United States today. So when you look at it, you've got sort of the grandfather, which is einkorn, the, the father or mother, which is uh, durum, and then you've got the modern bread 
uh, red wheat. Red wheats uh, can have things like red fife or red hard winter wheats or white wheats or uh, all of those are just different colors of wheat, different varietals of wheat, uh, just like there are many different types of apples. It's not just green and red, but there's red delicious and empire and all sorts of other types. There used to be hundreds and hundreds of types of wheat that were grown in the United States uh, and it would be endemic to a specific region because they grew really well there because of the winters or the soil type and all of that. Nowadays, pretty much all wheat that you're buying in the store is going to be a uh, red hard winter wheat because uh, it's something that grows pretty universally, especially in the Great Plains of the United States where most of our wheat is grown. Uh, what it's really good at is being uh, high in gluten. Uh, it can have several seasons that are grown in a single year. Uh, what it's bad at is it doesn't have as much flavor to it, doesn't have as much genetic diversity if you care about biodiversity in your food supply. Uh, it's a balance trying to figure out, uh, oftentimes in cooking, you do have these sort of trade-offs. Do you want something that's going to be more profitable, more shelf stable, more uh, resilient, or you know, something that's going to be more resilient and have more biodiversity and flexibility to it. So there are a bunch of different types of wheat out there. Uh, if you're working with ancient grains, uh, they're probably going to operate different than modern grains would in the recipes that you're using, uh, mostly because the recipes you're using are going to be geared towards just the, the wheat that you can find most part in stores. So Related question, uh -huh. how do you achieve different levels of gluten in bread? And then somewhat you've been talking about, how do you have different kinds of wheat? Yeah, so how do you achieve different levels of gluten in bread? Uh, so if you're baking bread, you know, the bread recipe we're talking about tonight, you can make it with 100%. How do you achieve different levels of gluten in flour? Oh, how do you achieve it? Um, yeah. There we go. Uh, how do you achieve different levels of gluten in flour? Well, first, Continue that thought. I usually make it with a mixture of bread and all-purpose. You can make it with all-purpose. You're going to get different results depending on the amount of gluten. How it starts out with having more or less gluten, uh, it's basically the variety of wheat. Uh, so the variety of wheat, they might be uh, higher gluten varieties or lower gluten varieties. Uh, it also depends on the season that uh, summer wheats, I believe, have higher gluten levels. Oh, it's been a while. One or the other, one season has higher gluten levels than the other. Um, there's also you know, ways you can sort of intervene uh, that when you look at uh, cake flour, so cake flour, pretty much you can't grow a modern wheat that has that low of gluten level. Uh, so they actually remove some of the gluten uh, chemically by uh, wrecking it, destroying it, leach as usually. Um, so that's how they sort of come from. Uh, different varieties of wheat. Uh, usually in your gro normal grocery store, you're not going to find different varieties of wheat. Uh, there are brands you can order online, uh, as well as ones you can find at your farmer's market uh, that might be freshly milled uh, and that will have different flavors to them. Okay, and if I need bread with two different flowers, would Nathan be able to tell? <laughs> Uh, if you changed nothing else, uh, probably, maybe. Usually when I teach this class in person, uh, I actually bake the same recipe with three different types of flours in terms of different types of wheat. Um, when you look at whole wheat, uh, King Arthur does sell both a red whole wheat and a white whole wheat, uh, and they have really different flavors to them. Uh, and we usually do a flour tasting where uh, you can just take a pinch of your flour and put it on your tongue, and you'll be able to taste that right away, even with the raw flour. Um, would I be able to taste it? Maybe. Uh, I won't say I have the best palate in the world, uh, but if I knew it was coming, I could probably pretend it was by new. Okay, and you might get into this, but is fresh milled grains much higher in gluten, or will it end up about the same, just more fresh? Um, it usually. Usually what you find in the store, uh, the question was, is the uh, fresh flour going to be better or worse than flour that's been aged? So most flour you buy has intentionally been aged, it's been siloed for a while. Uh, that gives it time for it to dry out uh, so that it's less likely to go bad later on, gives it some opportunity for the flavors to change. Uh, part of the change is that it actually lessens the flavor to it. Uh, 
fresher flowers will usually have more taste and tang to them. Uh, their gluten levels, my understanding is their like glutenids aren't going to be quite as receptive until they've dried out more and they've they've been around for longer. So it will operate differently. It's even the same type of wheat that's been ground uh, more recently or less recently. All right. So one question was answered in the chat, which was how long does flour last before it goes bad? And there was a Google search that <laughs> confirmed. Do we want to test your knowledge, maybe? Well, <laughs> the question of how long does flour last before it goes bad? Uh, I think it depends a lot on the type of flour. As I said, uh, bleached flour is going to last a lot longer than unbleached flour uh, because it's bleached flour is uh, flour that's really had bleach or bromine gas pushed through it and it kills all the microbes in there. Uh, and that means there's not microbes in there to go bad as quickly. White flour is going to go bad less quickly because it doesn't have as many fats in there or as many nutrients and those won't sort of sour. Uh, in terms of sort of shelf life, uh, Pantry mods are going to be one of your bigger struggles. Smelling it is going to be a good way to tell. If you know you're not baking very frequently and you have good, fresh, whole wheat flour, you can stick it in the fridge and it'll last for a couple months. It'll eventually absorb all the flavors of your fridge, so stick it in a plastic bag. Uh, though if it's too moist in there, then it will end up going bad. Uh, when it's just uh, white flour that's in your pantry, uh, that's good for a few months. Uh, and if you're not going through it quick enough, you just need to be baking more, and then it's not a worry. What did Google say? So, Nathan Walker, I'm going to unmute you, and you can tell us what Google said, since you're the one who conducted the search. Oh, great. Um, so, according to Google, um, for white, pla uh, for white flour, flour, it should last for about a year if stored at room temperature, and two years if chilled in the fridge or freezer. A whole wheat flour is more volatile and will retain its quality for only about three months, six months if it's sold in the fridge, and about a year if frozen. Awesome. Thank sure. you. Um, and then we have the next question, which is you did talk about a little bit, but how should I store my flour? Yeah, usually you'll want to, how do you store your flour? And then related to that is the reason why they come in paper bags that are hard to pour. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a pet peeve, from a, from a close friend. <laughs> uh, so how do you store it? You store it usually in the way you get it. And the reason why it comes in a paper bag is that that's a pretty good way to store flour. Uh, if you store it in a plastic bag and there's moisture in there, that's eventually going to help mold grow. Uh, so you want it to be able to be a little bit breathable. Uh, that could be paper or cloth. Uh, I know people who pour out all their flour into cloth bags because that will also be able to breathe. Uh, if you have a bin of some sort uh, that you, you know, store, pour everything into, that's okay. As long as you've got a little bit of breathing room there, you're going to be pretty good to go. All right, and there's more. Do we have time for more? Sure. Okay. This is a good question. Does Big Bread have an agenda related to pushing certain flowers or certain types of wheat? <laughs> Does Big Bread? Uh, does Big Red have an agenda? Uh, industrial agriculture definitely has an agenda, and that agenda is to make money. Uh, and <laughs> they are pretty successful at that by, at times, catering to the tastes of people. Sometimes our uh, less evolved palates that just want something sweet and nice and pleasant. Uh, when you talk to people about bread, you know, sometimes you don't always want something that's big and complicated. Sometimes you just want to boring piece of bread. Uh, I, for the most part, would prefer to have things that are flavorful and adding to my meal every time I eat. Uh, but it's uh, in part a question of supply and demand, for, for better or for worse. All right, we need, we need to see visual proof of your 50 pound bag of flour. Uh, so if you live in Portland, I got a super industrial 50 pound bag of flour. Unlike my usual unbleached kind of hippie bread, uh, ADM supermarket to the world is uh, who supplied this. I'm gonna be curious to start baking with it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I haven't bought sort of big flour in a long time, uh, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And the only reason we have this class tonight is that I was able to supplement with a little bit of this. 
How long do you think it will take you to use that bag of flour? Uh, three months, probably. Uh, to go through that whole bag of flour. Uh, we eat a lot of baked goods in this house. So we, we've got, that's where Nathan gets those muscles. <laughs> <laughs> Lifting bags of flour. All right, any other flour questions? I think that's it, unless people have a last minute write in. But the question, we know we have some outstanding questions on starters, so we're, we're, we're gonna get there eventually. Yeah. We'll jump, we'll jump there eventually. All right, then our next ingredient that we'll talk about uh, is salt. Uh, so almost all breads will have salt in them. Uh, I have three types of salt here. If you wanna go down to my hand cam. Um, so I have just iodized table salt here. Um, I have sea salt and then I have kosher salt. Uh, salt, uh, when you say salt in a cooking context, uh, you're usually talking about sodium chloride. Salt in sort of the chemistry world can refer to a lot of things, uh, but all these salts are basically the same thing. Uh, salt has three big uh, sort of influences in what you're gonna be tasting when you eat, and that's gonna be uh, biological differences, chemical differences, and just straight up flavor. When you look at these salts, the sort of main difference is that when you look at the sea salt, uh, it's these really large flakes to it. Uh, this is just dried out of ocean water. When you look at table salt, it's these very fine grains of salt. This was going to be mined from an ancient sea that was buried and came out of the ground. It's also iodized, which means it had iodine added to it. Um, and then we have kosher salt. Uh, kosher salt is a slightly larger grain. Um, it's called kosher salt because you use it for koshering meat uh, and for basically pulling uh, blood out of uh, meat. Um, all these will do basically the same thing with one another when you're baking. Uh, the sort of big thing to be thinking about is going to be just a question of sort of price and utility. Um, this sea salt was a gift, but it was expensive and fancy salt. Uh, this iodized salt is super cheap, as is the kosher salt. Uh, why you might use one versus the other, uh, if you don't like iodine, uh, it is an essential element that you need to have in your diet. Uh, so the government mandates that it's added to salt because it's figured that everybody is going to eat salt uh, one way or the other and get a little bit of iodine that way if they're not getting into other parts of the diet. Um, this is a really fine grain. Uh, this is a slightly larger grain. The sort of difference there is when you have a larger grain of something, less of it's going to fit into a teaspoon or a tablespoon. Uh, so when you are looking at a recipe, for the most part, they're probably actually asking for table salt, unless they specifically say kosher salt. If you were to try and put a tablespoon of sea salt versus a tablespoon of uh, this uh, table salt, you're going to get a lot more salt in the table salt because there's gonna be a lot less room for air. Whereas these large flakes are going to sort of fall in a way that's sort of being, gonna be clunky rather than organized and compact. So you can get about 50% more salt in a tablespoon of salt if it's those fine grains versus big grains. So if what you're baking is way too salty, you're not salting enough, part of that might just be an issue of the salt that you're using. All right, go back up in the face. Um, so when you add salt, as I said, it has sort of three big components. Uh, chemical is one of the first ones. So we've talked about gluten already. So gluten starts off that big tangle. It untangles by kneading it, or if you're doing a no knead recipe, by just sort of letting it slowly untangle itself by sitting there. Adding in salt uh, is going to give it a chance for it to start forming bonds with other strands of gluten. So those long sort of pulley strands you see when you're making dough, uh, they will start forming into those bonds and give you those walls of gluten when you've added salt. Uh, because the chemical of salt is sort of good at clinging on to things. So that's the sort of chemical advantage. Uh, the biological one is that it changes the way yeast behaves. We'll talk about yeast a little bit here, uh, but yeast uh, naturally is sort of gonna be reproducing and making new little yeasty babies. Uh, unless you give it a little bit of salt in there to sort of trigger it to change its behavior. 
salt uh, shows it that maybe it's not going to be quite as hospitable of a world for it to raise a family in. Uh, and it's going to go from making lots of little yeast babies to instead making more uh, carbon dioxide and acid and alcohol for you. So salt's going to change the way your yeast behaves. And then finally, salt is going to add flavor. Um, salt tastes salty, and we need some salt to live. Uh, so we're sort of biologically tuned to like salt. Uh, but salt also makes things taste more like those things. Uh, if you have a spoonful of sugar and then a spoonful of sugar with a bit of salt in it, uh, the one with salt in it is going to taste sweeter than the one without because it's a universal flavor enhancer. It just enhances whatever is already there. So your bread flavors will taste even breadier once you've added salt to them. So salt is going to be useful for uh, biology, chemistry, and for sort of your own enjoyment. The big thing to think about is what grain of salt you're using. My big takeaway is uh, it's not going to change the flavor of your bread that much. Uh, so if you've got a nice pink Himalayan salt, uh, mixing it in, you're not going to taste as much as you would if you were just sprinkling on top of a finished product. So save your dollars in your good salt or uh, as a finishing salt rather than as a mixing and using salt. It won't harm you uh, except for your pocketbook. Are there any questions on salt? None on salt. Huh. People know their salt. <laughs> All right. Uh, then the next ingredient, which hopefully also isn't too complicated, is water. Uh, water is a really important ingredient. Uh, as we've already talked about, water is sort of what makes the magic happen of those glutenids beginning to form into those chains of gluten. It's going to take dry flour and make it to dough. Uh, the really important thing to know about water is it's also going to be uh, great for changing the temperature of your dough. Uh, so the temperature of flour is really important, just as is everything else, because yeast is a living, breathing thing. And just like you or I, it operates differently depending on the temperature. If it's colder, it's going to be a bit slower. And if it's hotter, it's going to be a bit faster than what it's doing. It's perfectly possible to change the uh, temperature of your flour, but it's a lot easier to just change the tap and change the temperature of your water. Uh, so if this is a really cold day outside, you might want to use warmer water. If it's a really hot day, you might want to use cooler water. Because ideally, most of what you're going to be doing is around room temperature in the 70s. Uh, and water is going to be the easy way to make that happen. Other things to think about with water, uh, this I pre-pour and just let it sit. The way to make it room temperature is just have a pitcher of it around. Some people water, uh, worry a lot about their water having lots of chlorine in it, uh, and that chlorine killing off the leavening agents they have in their bread. Uh, if you let it sit, the chlorine will actually just naturally sort of uh, disappear and sublimate it off uh, and get out of your water. So that will clear that up. In some parts of the country, you have uh, really hard waters or tangy waters. Letting it sit will also help some with that. That's water. Any questions on water? None at the moment. All right. I can tell people are holding back on their questions because they want to get to the main event, the really exciting topic of leavening agents. Woohoo! Uh, so when I talk about breads, uh, as I said, it's got to have a flour of some sort. Uh, it's got to be cooked. But it also has a leavening agent of, it, of some sort, perhaps. Uh, when I talk about the world of bread, uh, I am pretty open-minded. Uh, and I say that breads fit into sort of four big categories. Uh, and those four categories are unleavened breads. Uh, this is a tortilla. Uh, it's a wheat bread. Um, all of these have wheat as the main ingredient. Uh, a tortilla, just like all other flat breads or unleavened breads, is going to basically be you take a dough and you don't put anything else in it. You don't put any leavening agents in it, no yeast, nothing else. And then you just cook it right away. Um, this, you just sort of smash flat, and it cooks. Uh, flatbreads are great uh, because they're super tasty, because they're fairly easy to make, uh, because they're going to be uh, great for wrapping things in. I mean, what would life be without burritos? Uh, they're also useful in that uh, oftentimes with things like crackers, texture, uh, they don't stale as easily because you're not going for all that pull and the complexity that you have with something like uh, leavened bread. So flatbreads, that's your first category. Your second category is something 
like a popover gear. Um, so popovers are what I call <laughs> popovers are what we call a mechanically leavened bread. Uh, so popovers don't have any leavening agents in it. So this started off as just basically looks like a thin batter, and you see it gets this huge hole in it. And I basically just mix together uh, eggs and milk and a little bit of flour, and you stick it in a really hot pan, and it puffs up just from the mixing I've done of the eggs. Uh, mechanical oven breads might also be things like steam buns or croissants. It's any situation where you're having the power of steam uh, giving you the primary rise in your bread. Um, these are really great because uh, oftentimes they have butter in them and butter is delicious. Uh, they're really great because they have oftentimes really complex flavors and, and textures to them without a lot of work. Um, but sometimes when you're talking about something like your croissant, it's a ton of work. Uh, a croissant basically works by having dough and then butter and then dough and then butter and you have these layers of dough and butter over and over again. And when you stick it in the oven, uh, the yeast is doing some of the work, but a lot of the work is coming from the butter. Uh, butter is around 90% fat, 10% water if you're using high quality butter. And that water turns to steam and it lifts things up. And that gives you the rise between your layers of a croissant. Uh, something like this in a popover, uh, it has a little bit of butter in there as well to sort of puff it up, but it's mostly the eggs that's giving the rise. So mechanically leavened breads for the second category. Uh, then we have chemically leavened breads. Uh, this is a scone uh, that I made a few weeks ago and had in our freezer. It's a chocolate chip scone. Uh, it is made with uh, chemical leaveners. So you'll be familiar with the world of chemical leaveners, uh, baking soda and baking powder. Uh, and you may also be familiar with cream of tarts. Uh, Baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, uh, is basically uh, it's a base. Uh, well, I'm not intended there. Uh, it's a base, and when you add an acid, you might remember the volcano you made back in elementary school. Uh, you mix an acid and a base together, uh, they explode and they create carbon dioxide. Uh, so baking soda is just sodium bicarbonate, which is just a mineral that you mine out in the world. Uh, Baking powder is sodium bicarbonate, uh, so it's just baking soda, plus some sort of stable acid uh, and something that's going to sort of keep them dry and separated, like cornstarch usually. So you can make your own baking powder with baking soda plus something like cream of tartar. Uh, cream of tartar is basically a powdered acid uh, and these two things combined basically make this. Um, quick breads are called quick breads because they are super quick. Uh, they are easy to make. Uh, they don't take anything living. Uh, they're pretty foolproof as long as your baking soda, baking powder are still fairly fresh. Uh, baking soda, baking powder, they do go bad, especially if you're in an environment that's pretty damp or pretty polluted. Uh, the acid in the sort of acid rain air uh, mist you get in some cities, it's enough to start sort of losing some of the puff and some of the potential you have in your baking soda. Also just moisture in general will make your baking powder activate and make the mixture of, your, of the acid and base there start touching one another. So after only about three or four months, these start going bad. Um, going bad doesn't mean that they're gonna cause you any harm but it does mean that they're no longer going to give you the desired result. Uh, so if you have old boxes of these, uh, I'd suggest rotating them out so that you're using something fresher. If you're making cake or cookies or something and it's not coming together, uh, one of the reasons might be because you don't have fresh enough uh, ingredients there. So those are quick breads. Um, so we have a quick question. Can you repeat the difference between baking powder and baking soda? Mm -hmm. So baking soda, uh, is just sodium bicarbonate, so it's just the base, which is base is the opposite of an acid. Uh, whereas baking soda is both the base and the acid with some cornstarch or some other stabilizer to keep them from interacting. So when you're baking with baking powder, it usually means there's no other acids in whatever you're cooking. If you're making something like cookies uh, and nothing else is acidic in there, 
uh, it's going to need both elements so that it can react. If you're using baking soda, you've probably got something like a dairy product in there, or maybe a uh, vinegar or lemon juice or something like that that's going to activate the baking soda. It's seven o'clock, which is usually when we go outside and applaud uh, all of our emergency workers. Uh, we hear the, the shouting outside. I don't know if you can hear them, but we will say thank you to all those, maybe on this call even, who are doing really hard work uh, during this really difficult time. Uh, I thank you. I, <laughs> I hope some baked goods will help you out. Uh, so if you don't have any baking powder, you can make baking soda by basically having baking soda plus an acid. So that acid could be cream tartar, but it could also be lemon juice or a little bit of vinegar or something like that. Uh, if you only have baking powder and you needed to have baking soda, you can't reverse the process, uh, but it won't be a terrible result. Uh, you probably just have it tasting a little bit more acidic than it would have otherwise if you're just replacing the baking soda with baking powder, and it'll still rise up. So those are for quick breads. Other thing to think about when you're mixing quick breads, uh, that you want to mix them fairly quickly. Uh, once you've added in the liquid, uh, they're going to start activating, and they're going to start releasing the carbon dioxide, and that is uh, going to go away. Uh, and you're going to not have something as fluffy. So you don't want to mix it too much. You're going to lose your carbon dioxide at that point. So, any other questions on quick breads? Uh, I read that you can sub three times the amount of baking powder for baking soda. Is that correct? Sure, that seems reasonable. Uh, uh, three seems more than I would have instinctually gone for, but uh, if the internet says that, I'll trust the internet on this topic. Okay, that's all we've got on baking soda and baking powder. All right. So, as we've talked about, we had unleavened breads, matzah, crackers, tortillas. Uh, we have mechanically leavened breads, popovers, croissants, steam buns. Uh, we had quick breads. And then we get to my favorite, yeasts. Uh, so, the world of yeast. Uh, this is a bag of active dry yeast. Um, You've probably seen it in bags, maybe sometimes in packets or in jars. Uh, active dry yeast is just a sort of powdered version of yeast. Uh, yeast is a single cell organism. Uh, it lives by basically eating sugars and producing as output uh, acids, alcohols, other simple sugars, and carbon dioxide. Uh, yeast lives all around us. It's in the air, it's on our hands, it's in fruit, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can sort of see its action. I've added a little bit of water here and it sort of bubbled up uh, quickly and deflated already. Uh, but proving your yeast is by adding some water, you can start to see that life in the yeast. Uh, yeast is all around us. Uh, you, we've been using yeast for a long, long time. The first yeasts that humans interacted with uh, were probably to make beer or wine. Um, it was quite possibly an accident. Uh, somebody left some grape juice sitting around too long. They came back. They discovered alcohol, and uh, life was good. They made the same happy accident. Uh, and we eventually began to sort of figure out how to control this invisible helper we had in the kitchen, that is yeast. Uh, yeast sort of began as this mystery. Uh, it has a really strong place in a lot of global faiths that uh, bread and wine uh, are central to Christianity, in part because they were seen as a magical force. You could take something sort of inert and boring like flour and turn it into something life-giving and wonderful and tasty like bread. You could take something boring like grape juice and make wonderful wines and beers and stuff like that. People started using all sorts of yeasts for a very long time before they finally figured out uh, in the mid 1800s what yeast was. Uh, they developed microscopes finally and started to see these little blobs, these little single cell organisms doing their work. Uh, Louis Pasteur was the one who sort of pushed forward. His pasteurization comes from him. Uh, 
he was able to figure out that there are many different types of strains of yeast out there that give you different flavors. Some types of yeast will eat this type of sugar that's in grapes or that type of sugar that's in wheat. Some types of yeast produce more alcohol, some produce more acid. Depending on what you're doing, you're going to want one type of yeast or another. Uh, most the yeast you probably interact with is one strain, which is boringly called baker's yeast. Baker's yeast was really good because it was good for baking with. Uh, baking is something where uh, you want to have a lot of carbon dioxide coming out, and that's going to give you the rise. Prior to the sort of discovery of baker's yeast and the development of getting this strain, figuring out ways to make it reproduce, figuring out a way to make it shelf stable like this, people are always using sourdough. They were using wild yeast. They were using whatever was in the air or on their hands or in their flour, and that's what they were stuck with. Those varieties of yeast, they had no control over what flavor they were getting besides just sort of starting a new sourdough starter and trying to figure things out. Commercial yeast was sort of a breakthrough because it finally allowed uniformity. Uh, sometimes if you're making you know, cinnamon buns, you might not want them to taste complex and interesting like sourdough. You just want them to taste sweet and boring. Uh, this is going to give you a good way to have a sweet, boring yeast so you can add in the uh, cinnamon or the cardamom or the orange or whatever flavoring you have to go on top of the bread. So you don't have to taste the bread itself all the time. Commercial yeast uh, sort of really expanded during the early 20th century until it took over. Pretty much every bread you're eating, uh, unless it's explicitly called out as a sourdough, is going to be made with commercial baker's yeast. Even when you're making some things that are labeled as sourdough, again, US labeling laws are pretty loose, might not be a sourdough. Uh, might be baker's yeast with acid and alcohol added back into it. It's only in the past couple decades that we've started to see a sort of resurgence of people wanting to use wild yeast, uh, especially in the past couple weeks, uh, because <laughs> we're in an exciting time where people want to feel connected to their sort of environment around them. So, as I explained, commercial yeast uh, is one specific type of yeast uh, that has got a very specific flavor to it. Sourdough uh, is going to be a yeast that is going to be what you catch. Um, this is some of my sourdough, Concord. Uh, I've had about 10 of you pick up some of this in the past week or so. Um, Concord is a sourdough culture. So when we talk about a sourdough culture, what we're talking about is that I caught some wild yeasts and I got them and I put them in a jar. And I have been able to keep them alive for about 15 years now by continuing to give them more of the things they want. I give them more flour to eat and more water to be able to sort of swim through. I don't really locomote, but to be able to sort of live Everything needs water. Uh, and that creates this sort of, as you can see, like mushy, sort of slimy, doughy consistency and texture. Uh, as you can see here, you got some bubbles here. Uh, those bubbles are an indication that it's been bubbling up. This is some of Concord that I actually haven't fed in about uh, four days. You can see it's much flatter. Uh, it's got a little bit of a shine on it. That's some of the alcohol and acid. Whereas at first, when you give sugar, to a sourdough starter, it's gonna produce a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, after time, it sort of switches over and just goes to alcohol and acid. So, a sourdough starter. This is a sourdough starter. Uh, I'm gonna sort of explain how Concord came to be and how I take care of them, because many of you have sourdough starters now or are going to get sourdough starters in the near future. Um, so Concord, I started when I was in college. Uh, in college, I started to learn how to bake at Deep Springs College, transferred to Oberlin College, where I lived in some co-ops. Uh, in the co-ops, uh, I really wanted to sort of focus on my baking that I started to learn. And uh, sourdough was a great way to sort of introduce people to the sort of joys and glory that isn't just sort of the boring old baking, but is something different every time. So I started a baking club, and me and the cool kids would get together on weekends, and rather than going out partying, we'd do some baking. And one particularly rambunctious weekend, we decided that we were going to start some sourdough cultures. So how did we do that? We said, what do we need? We need to think like a sourdough. What does a sourdough want? Yeast wants to have a place to live and a place to call home, something to eat, something to do, just like the rest of us. 
So we got together what we wanted this yeast to be eating, which was flour. We were using wheat flour, because that's where we're mainly going to be getting that. We mixed together that flour with some water. And then we just let it sit. Um, we put it in a bowl, and we actually didn't just do one of them. Uh, we did about a dozen of them. And some of them we just had flour and water. Others we intentionally put our hands in because we knew that there was yeast living on our skin. Others we intentionally put fruits in. We knew that there was yeast living on the skin of apples or of grapes. So we dumped apples and grapes in there, hoped that some of the yeast that was on those would get into the flour and water mixture. We let them sit. We covered them up. We lightly covered them with some plastic wrap or a towel. And we came back. And after a few days, 11 out of the 12 of them had started bubbling. And we started feeding them. We gave them more flour, more water, more of those things they needed to survive. And we kept going. Uh, eventually, they started bubbling more and more. And once they were up to strength, once we thought that they had enough life in them, uh, we started baking with them. And we basically did a bracketed tournament where we would bake the same recipe with two different starters at the same time. And we'd see how they tasted and how they tasted differently from one another. And they were super different. You know, one of them was in the living room, one was in the kitchen, one was in the bathroom, one we put outside. Some of them were really slow, some of them were really fast, some of them rose a lot, some of them didn't, some of them were sour, some of them were really sweet. And when the bathroom tasted ungodly bad. Uh, there were all sorts of different flavors there. And it's amazing to see that sometimes two that had sat right next to one another in the kitchen had really different personalities to them. So when we did this tournament, we picked which one we liked better and we threw out the one we liked less and we kept the one we liked more. And eventually Concord was the winner. Uh, I actually kept two for about a year. Eventually keeping two of them was just too much work. So I put the other one to rest and baked one final loaf with him. And I kept Concord going. Uh, kept Concord going just by continuing to give him what he wants. He wants to be at a reasonable temperature. Yeasts can live between uh, around 35 degrees and about 105 degrees. They start dying on any sort of either end of that afterwards. I give them more of what they want in terms of more food. So I'm continuing to feed it flour and water. Uh, every time I feed it, it's going to grow bigger. You know, as you can see, it's, it looks basically just like a mixture of flour and water right now, but with some life to it. Uh, if you were here or if you have your own sourdough starter, you can smell it. You can smell that life. You can tell that there's something living in there. Concord probably isn't just one type of yeast. It's probably, well actually, I now know, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's funny. So I used to teach the class and I'd say probably various types of yeast, but actually three years ago uh, Tufts University was doing a study on sourdough starters uh, where they're doing a genetic analysis and profile of sourdough. And I sent in my sourdough starter to see what types of yeast I had. And I had about six different types of yeast and I think it was about ten different types of bacteria that were all living in the sourdough. Some of which, you know, there's a lot more of one type of yeast than another, uh, but they're all living in this symbiotic relationship where maybe one type of yeast likes one part of the flour starch and another likes another. Maybe one yeast is eating the sugar and it eats it and then it pushes out a simple sugar that some type of bacteria really likes that simple sugar and it's coming and eating those byproducts of the yeast. And this way of sort of continuing to feed it, every time you give it flour and water, it grows, it gets bigger. You might be able to see that currently I have about this much in here. You can see the sort of strains, both because I've been pouring a lot of it lately. But every time I feed it, it grows larger and larger, both because it's bubbling, because of the carbon dioxide, but also just because I've added more substance into it. Every time you feed it, it will get bigger. If you never use it and you just keep feeding it, you will eventually go from having this much to that much, to a whole jar, to a whole bathtub. It will destroy the world. Uh, so eventually you have to sort of curb yourself. When people take care of a sourdough starter, they're either baking a lot with it, which means it sort of, it grows up and then you pour some off like I did here and you bake with it and then it goes back down. That sort of back and forth, I have sort of about a gallon and a half of variance here of how much sourdough starter I can have. If you're not baking all the time, you need to either feed it less, throw some away, or start baking more. Uh, <laughs> the sort of balance is going to be the more you feed your sourdough starter, uh, the happier and healthier it's going to be. It's going to have more to live and just more to go off of. The less you feed it, the less happy it's going to be. One of the reasons I really like working with sourdough is that most cooking you do, most baking you do, is with inert ingredients. It's with things that, you know, 
ideally your baking soda is always your baking soda. Your flour, if you're buying the same brand that's made the same way, it's gonna be the same every time. When you work with sourdough, it's got a personality. It's like having a pet that you get to eat, but it's a pet that you have to work with. Just like if you didn't feed your dog for a while, it would get snappish and angry and would not do tricks for you. It would instead be mean. If you don't feed your sourdough starter, it's also not gonna do tricks for you, and it's also gonna be mean. Sometimes it's off days. Sometimes you've been feeding it and you've been taking good care of it, but it still isn't gonna perform the way you want it to. So sourdoughs have personality. Um, getting to know that personality is a really fun, livening challenge to me, and a really sort of useful, fun thing to have around. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, can I pause you? There are like many questions. Many questions, <laughs> go for it. All right, so the first one is why is he a he? And why is he, that's a question for me. And <laughs> why is he called conquered? Uh, so he's a he because for some reason that's what I started calling him. <laughs> uh, often when people talk about sourdough starters, they call them mothers. Uh, because they give birth uh, all the time and reproduce. But what, for whatever reason, I just instinctually went male. Uh, I named him Concord uh, because, uh, as I said, when we started our sourdough starters, uh, some of them were just flour and water, some of them we seeded with stuff. Uh, this one we actually seeded with grapes. They were actually champagne grapes rather than Concord grapes. I didn't think champagne was a good name, so I called it Concord. Uh, my other one was called Russet because it was made with potatoes in the start. Do I know that some of the uh, yeast that's in here came from the skin of those grapes? No, uh, maybe it didn't. Uh, maybe it was something that was just in the air, uh, but that's what I went with and that's what he's continued as. Okay, so many questions. I'm gonna start with regular yeast or do you, did you have more to go into? Nope, okay. let's start so, yeasting. Multi-part question. Are yeast cakes still available? What is instant yeast? Difference between active, dry, and quick rise yeasts, and then the costs and benefits of using them. Great. Uh, so yeast, commercial baker's yeast is available in many forms. So this is active dry yeast, which is the most common sort of uh, commonly available yeast for you in the supermarket. Uh, there you can also have yeast cakes, yeast, yeast slurries, yeast cubes. Uh, all sorts of different types of yeast. They're all the same uh, variety of yeast. They're all baker's yeast that have just been stored in different ways. Uh, the advantages to them are subtle and sort of depend on what you're doing. Uh, active dry yeast, you have to activate by adding, the, adding some water to it. Uh, it's basically the yeast has been put into little pellets and given a little candy coating, just like a little yeasty m and m um, instant yeast is the same thing, that it also has that little coating, but it's been ground down finer, so it wakes up and it doesn't take as long to dissolve. Yeast slurries, which are just like liquid yeast, um, those are the quickest to wake up because they're already liquidized. Yeast cakes are, uh, when you feel them texture-wise, you know, they're a little bit mushy, uh, and it's going to be on that quicker level. It's also going to die faster because it doesn't have that protective coating on it, so you're probably only going to use yeast cakes if you have them on a regular basis. Uh, and you're baking on a regular basis. The advantage of this is that as long as you stick it in the fridge and keep it from getting uh, too wet, it's going to last you a few months before it goes bad. Little packets last even longer because they're fully sealed in tin foil without getting, getting wet. Okay, so a number of different questions about a healthy starter. Mm -hmm. So, Best feeding a starter, you talked about flour and water, but maybe you can talk about proportions. Yeah. So when you feed your starter, um, sort of general rule is that, as I said, the more you feed it, the happier it's going to be. There's a limit to that. Uh, in the sort of gradations, if you have it on the countertop, it's going to need to eat more often, as I said, because yeast is sort of temperature-based. That's its sort of normal pace. Uh, it will probably survive if you only feed it once or twice a week. It won't be happy, but it'll survive. Um, if you want it happy, you should probably feed it every day or every other day, sometimes twice a day. Uh, mine is really as happy as when I feed it twice a day, but I'm only doing that if I'm baking a lot, teaching in class, something like that. Uh, when I feed it, how much you feed it, sort of time and quantity are the two big measures here. Uh, it's really a a question of how much yeast you have. 
uh, if you have this much adding uh, a cup of flour is going to be different than if you had a whole bathtub full of yeast here. Adding a cup of flour wouldn't really help you there. Uh, my general rule is if you want your yeast the happiest, you should double its size every other time you feed it. So if you have a cup, you're going to add a combined cup of flour and water, and that's going to get you to two cups. And then you're going to feed it again and again, and then you'll be to four cups. And again, you're going to be in that doubling exponential growth pace. Um, that can be intimidating. So usually you want to try and keep sort of the lowest amount of starter you have to keep it viable, unless you're planning on baking a lot bigger. Another way of keeping it longer is by sticking in the fridge. It slows down its metabolism. It'll be perfectly happy to be in the fridge if you're only feeding it once a week. Uh, it'll be happy still. You can feed it as, as little as once a month. When I've gone on longer vacations, uh, I stick mine in the fridge and I'm able to sort of ignore it for a while and it just sort of goes to sleep and it's sort of slowly working its way. If you're really going away for a while, you can freeze it or you can dry it out and then come back to it later that way. So, uh, feeding it, um, you want to sort of feed it to keep it active and healthy. Uh, when you're baking with it, you want it hungry and ready. So you don't want to have just fed it, uh, in part because when you're feeding it, you're adding a lot more volume there. And the yeast, the small amount of yeast that was in there needs to populate that new volume. And it populates it by making more little yeast babies. And those yeast babies then fill everything up. So if you took this and added a bunch of flour and water, you're basically diluting the yeast and bacteria content that's in there. Uh, so having it hungry means it's probably going to be fully populated and ready to go. Okay. So then, related to that, what's the minimum amount of yeast starter you should keep? Um, minimum can be really bare bones. When I was working in France, I heard the story uh, of a bakery where uh, oftentimes there's a tension in bakery between pastry and bread. Uh, pastry is a very fine, exact science. We measure everything. Bread is more sort of loosey-goosey and freeform because you're working with a living thing. And this baker had this hundreds year old starter that this bakery had had passed down from generation to generation. And the bread baker owned the bakery and one day fired the pastry chef. And the pastry chef, in a fit of rage, took the sourdough starter and threw it into the alleyway behind the bakery. And the baker came in the next morning and saw that his starter was gone and looked out in the alleyway and was able to just take you know, a little teaspoon of that starter put it into a jar and start feeding it more flour and water and it came back to life. Uh, it really doesn't take much for it to keep alive. So as long as you've got just like a little bit of a, a sheen of starter in your jar or in your container, you're good to go. All right. So similar questions. When you have a starter, should you keep it sealed or have it open to the air? Good question. So here you see that it's a clap top jar I've got with this little seal on it. But what you'll notice is that this is the type of jar that normally has a rubber gasket. And that rubber gasket keeps it airtight. I've taken that out because you don't want it actually to be airtight. You're producing carbon dioxide. It's like blowing up a balloon, except it's a glass balloon. If you keep blowing it up, it'll eventually break glass uh, if you've got a strong and healthy enough starter. Um, so you want a little bit of room so that it can sort of breathe. But you don't want it so open that things are going to fall in it, dog hair, dust. Uh, flies, things like that. Um, sourdoughs, once they're healthy, they, they get their own immune system and they basically can fight off infection that they figure out, and they've done studies on this, where you put in fruit fly eggs. Fruit flies eat yeast and they'll lay their eggs in a starter so that their, their larvae can eat yeast. And the sourdough will actually go and release types of acid that will kill the fruit fly eggs. If uh, green mold or black mold lands on it, they'll release a different type of alcohol that's good at killing molds. So they start to be territorial in defending themselves, but it's good to give them a leg up by not allowing them to dry out, by keeping them covered, by not making, by making sure too much stuff isn't getting there and infect you. Okay, can you feed starter with a different kind of flour than was originally used? Yeah, you can convert your starter. Uh, so can you feed it with a different type of flour? Certainly. Uh, I feed mine all purpose flour that's wheat, because that's mostly what I bake with. If you're going to be baking a lot of rye breads, you might want to start feeding rye to your starter. Uh, it will change the starter, because maybe there are types of starches that are in wheat that aren't in rye. Over time, it'll sort of self-select, and you'll lose some yeasts, you'll maybe gain some new ones, uh, and it'll change its flavor. At that point, you'll have the yeasts that are ready to eat 
the ingredient and what you're going to be cooking with. Uh, so there are starters that when I was in southern India, there are sourdoughs that you use for rice, where you just feed rice flour in there and it keeps going. Um, whatever you're working with, you can sort of adapt it and usually it will be able to convert over. Other yeast questions? All right. So we have some questions about essentially health of the starter. Uh -huh. So if your starter isn't doubling, what should you do? And then if the starter is thinner, should you just add more flour? And if it's drier and full of air, should you add more water? Excellent. That is a topic I did not talk about yet. Is when you're feeding it, what do you feed it? How much do you feed it? Is it flour and water? It's a mixture. Um, when you feed your sourdough starter, there are different uh, philosophies on this based on different cultures and different traditions. Uh, I do what's called 100% hydration. So that means I'm feeding equal weight of flour and water to my sourdough starter. So water is about twice as dense as flour. So that means volume wise, I'm adding, if I'm adding one cup of flour, I'm adding half a cup of water. Uh, and that means that it's about equal weight that you're getting in there. That'll get you to this sort of thick pancake consistency. Uh, there are some people who keep a very stiff starter that looks like a dough. There are some people who keep a really wet starter. Most recipes are probably asking for about 100% hydration unless they're gonna specify otherwise. You can convert things over just by starting to feed it more flour or more water. Uh, the more water you have in there, uh, the bacteria like a wetter environment, so you're probably going to have more bacterial action going on. If it's a firmer, it's going to be more yeast that's in there. That's going to change the flavor, and it's going to depend on what type of starter you have and, and what your culture is. It's going to be that balance. Uh, yeah. And then, um, is there... Do you stir it before you pour it out? Um, Sure, you can. So when you feed it, you want to stir it, make sure you get rid of any clumps of flour you have in there. Uh, get it to a sort of nice consistency so you're not getting pockets. Those pockets are going to be uh, opportunities for infection where something could go in there and molds could start growing in that flour and the sourdough wouldn't be able to go in there and, and help itself out. Uh, so stir it a lot. When you're pouring it out, uh, I do all of my baking based on uh, weight rather than volume, uh, mostly because volume is not really very accurate. If you're measuring starter by volume, it might be really fluffy right now, and that would mean you're getting a different amount than if it's compacted. That carbon dioxide isn't the important part. Similarly, a cup of flour isn't always a cup of flour. Uh, if you have it compacted in versus mounded versus little holes in there, whereas a pound of flour is always a pound of flour, uh, and you're getting consistency in that way. Okay, so two questions related to temperature. Uh-huh. So if you put your starter in the fridge to slow it down, do you need to let it come back to room temperature for, before feeding? And then what temperature of water should you add to the starter when feeding? Um, yeah, so the question, if you have it in the fridge, should you take it out before you bake with it? Yes. Uh, it will be sort of slow and sluggish in the fridge and you want to give it time to sort of wake up and be active again. Uh, taking it out a day beforehand, two days beforehand, letting it warm up and feeding it a couple times will sort of make it realize, oh, I'm back in this mode of making, uh, making carbon dioxide and shifting over. In the fridge, it's going to be doing more acid and alcohol and you probably want more carbon dioxide if you're trying to get a nice fluffy bread there. Uh, the other question, temperature of water. Um, again, you want to sort of keep everything room temperature. Uh, so you're going to give it water that's probably room temperature if you got it. Again, if it's a hot day, you might do it cool water. Just give it a nice refreshing uh, bit. Uh, looking at baker's yeast, you know, oftentimes people talk about baker's yeast that they tell you to add warm water. Um, really, that 100 degree mark is as hot as you want to get. After that, you're killing your yeast. Uh, if a recipe is telling you to use boiling water or something, it's a bad recipe, stop using that recipe. Uh, you want to have things that are warm water, uh, feeling sort of a baby's milk, uh, having it inside of your wrist. If it's getting uncomfortable there, it's probably even uncomfortable for you, Brad. And then you talked about the weight, you, you use weight 
uh, rather than measurement, but how to determine how much starter to use in place of yeast in a recipe. Hmm, converting. So converting a recipe from commercial yeast to sourdough, uh, it's a bit of trial and error. Uh, I don't have a solid metric uh, because anytime you're gonna be changing over from commercial yeast to sourdough, you're also gonna be changing a lot of the times and that's gonna change fundamentals. Commercial yeast, you know, as I said, it, it was bred explicitly because it produces a lot of carbon dioxide very quickly. And it's very resilient. Sourdough, depending on what you have, it might be quick, but you might have a slow one depending on your personal starter. Uh, so I would usually sort of, uh, you can't just do a one for one replacement if it says like a tablespoon of yeast, you can't just add a tablespoon of starter. It's not gonna be all that much yeast in that starter. Um, I'd add probably at least a half a cup of starter in there or a cup. Um, you have to recognize that when you're adding starter, the starter has water and flour in it. So that's gonna impact the amount of flour and water in your recipe. So you'll wanna reduce the flour and water that you are adding otherwise for whatever the recipe called so that it's not going to be too uh, wet from the sour that started being wet in there. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> so being conscious of time, it looks like it's 7.30, which is what I promised you would get through all of this by now. Uh, but we still have the final act, which is actually making bread. Um, I've talked to you about what good bread is, about what the basic ingredients are. Now I'm going to sort of speed walk you through how you actually make uh, make some bread. Um, so first step, um, having a nice bowl. Uh, there is a well method. You can just do things on the countertop, but it's a lot easier. I've pre-weighed all these ingredients, and I'm going to just pour them in. The first things you need to pour in are going to be the flour and the water. I pour them in and then just mix them together. Uh, one thing you'll be able to see, if you want to switch to the hand cam, uh, is that really quickly you start having gluten form. Um, now this was just powdery flour before, but you can already start to see as I mix it, that you're getting these sort of strands of gluten that are forming. It pulls together and holds together in this sort of sticky way. Once you mix it more, uh, you're introducing more and you can see these little chunks of dough that are starting to build up. Um, I'm just going to mix together the flour and water and even a little bit more mixing. You can start to see this sort of scrappiness to the dough here. It's really weak. It falls apart as soon as you stretch it, uh, but you've got at least something sort of holding itself together from those gluten. I'm going to let it sit now while we talk about tools um, that we are going to go through with this a stage that's called uh, autolyze. Autolyze is basically an opportunity for that gluten to start to form. You want to let it sit for about 20 minutes before adding in your yeast and salt because it's a chance for the gluten to start to form, uh, for everything to start getting absorbed, and then you'll come back to it once it is done with that. So I'm going to lightly cover it. Um, my bowl just happens to have uh, a nice little cover here. Um, and talk about tools. Uh, as you guys may have seen in the file I attached the calendar invite, uh, there's some tools that I think are really important to have and others that I think are less important. One of the things I really love about bread baking is that it is something that really at its core only requires having an oven to bake things in. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of gadgets. That said, there are some gadgets that will make your life a lot easier uh, to live with. Um, so one of the gadgets, you know, we already talked about measuring, uh, whether you're using uh, volume versus weight. I'm going to recommend getting just a sort of home scale, something like this, that's going to have a digital scale that gives you accurate measures, calibrates every time. It's going to be much more accurate and consistent methods. Uh, when I first started to learn how to bake at Deep Springs, I was learning from a guy who had gone to pastry school beforehand. And uh, when he started learning how to make bread, uh, he taught me his method, uh, which was do things both a very quantitative and a qualitative way. So he was having me measure everything, where I was measuring the temperature of the flour and the water and the timing. 
I was measuring exactly how much flour and yeast went in there. And I was doing it very quantitative. And then qualitatively, I was writing down you know, what the yeast smelled like, and what it looked like, how it felt when I was kneading it, what it looked like after its rises. And those two things combined were able to teach me how to make good bread because it made me pay attention every step. Some of those quantitative things were really useful. Getting measurements, they helped me know sort of how to change things based on conditions. If it was really humid out, I needed to use less water. If it was really hot, I needed to use cooler water. All of those little shifts, only by having those measurements was I able to get there. But also the qualitative side was really useful. By writing it down and keeping a bread diary, I was able to start seeing when my sourdough smells this way, it's going to behave this way. It might rise faster because it smells like this right before it rises faster. Or if it feels this way, I can tell it's gonna need more salt because you can feel that it's sticky in a, a tacky way that you wouldn't be able to tell otherwise. So having a tool like a scale is a really useful way to be able to start to measure things. Another tool you want is a bench knife or a bench scraper. Um, it's basically just a piece of stainless steel. Uh, these are really useful both for cutting your dough and for cleaning your countertops. Cutting your dough, uh, they're really important because you can just sort of clip it in half. We'll show you that in a little bit. Um, you've spent so much time developing all that gluten, paying attention to gluten, you don't want to just destroy it by ripping it apart. You instead want to make sure that you cut it. So you have two nice pieces of gluten on the side rather than two sort of mangled pieces. These are also good for cleaning up your countertops. When you get things stuck on here, you can just put a little bit of water on there or even do it dry and just scrape it off. If you're cooking it all on a regular basis, having this as a tool is going to be a really useful way not to make all your sponges all gunky and gross. Um, so that's a really useful tool to have. Uh, if you have tile countertops, I'd recommend not trying to knead on them because they're, they're just going to get gunky and unthinkable. In addition to the scale, uh, measurement, uh, thermometer, this is just a digital thermometer that I have that can be candy thermometer, a meat thermometer, anything. Uh, it's really useful, especially when you start to be able to tell the temperature of things. Uh, you might want to tell the temperature of your dough after you've kneaded it to see what's going on there. Uh, other tools, um, a mixer. Uh, so many of you probably have a KitchenAid mixer that has a dough hook like this. Uh, I recommend when you're learning how to bake, at first mixing and kneading by hand because it is really useful to start to get to know your dough. Once you start baking for a long time, it's really useful to have a mixer. Uh, I held out for years. I used to teach this class and I'd be baking 10, 15 loaves of bread and I'd be doing it all by hand and my forearms were very strong, but it took so long and it was so much easier once I finally got my mixer. Uh, so having a mixer, useful tool, not essential. Um, one thing to watch out for with a mixer, if you're kneading by hand, it's really hard to knead something too long by hand because you will get tired before your bread does. If you're kneading with a mixer, uh, you can end up breaking your bread or your mixer if you knead too long. Uh, once the gluten really starts to develop, uh, it will eventually develop too many bonds and then start breaking itself and ripping itself apart. Once it gets that real stiffness, then it's going to have troubles where uh, it might destroy the motor of, of your mixer. So be aware of that. Uh, limit yourself to about 10 minutes when you're mixing on medium speed. With your mixer. Other tools. Um, if you want to walk away from this bread class feeling like you have come away knowing how to do something wonderful, getting a brock foreman or Benetton or proofing basket, which is what this is, uh, is the way to do it. So when you look at this bread I have, uh, you can see that it's got these nice lines on it. Uh, those lines are from the wicker basket that it was rising in. Uh, it rises as dough like this, upside down. You flip it out and it goes into the oven and it comes out. These are really useful in that they provide structure so that it can have something to be rising in and against so it's not sort of free form getting loose. It's also really useful in that it is uh, going to wick some of the moisture out. Um, if you were letting it rise just in a glass or a metal bowl, none of the moisture is going to leave your dough and it's going to get uh, sort of sticky and tacky there and your crust isn't going to be as crispy and crunchy. Some of that crispness also comes from having yeast living in here. So I leave this flour in here and the yeast just sort of chills out, goes to sleep, waits until the next time I make bread. That's going to feed uh, some of these bubbles that you can see here on 
the edges of my bread crust. Those bubbles are what give you a nice, crispy, crunchy uh, crust when you're eating bread. They're really satisfying to eat. And having a natural uh, basket like this, you can get silicone ones. I prefer uh, using something like a reed because it lasts longer. Um, so those are, that's the sort of cheat if you want to have an easy way to go through life. Um, next tool that might be useful is a lom. Uh, so this is a lom, uh, or basically a razor blade and a stick. You can use a knife as well. Uh, but basically, this is used for slashing your dough. So when you look at the finished bread we have here, I clearly cut it along this. That cutting pattern allowed it to grow in the oven. That growth is oven spring. Um, if you don't cut it open, it's going to rip. It's going to have these sort of unsightly bulges to it, where it's going to be uneven, where eventually the steam that's inside is going to need to escape somehow. And it's going to bust through the edges. Giving it a way out by slashing it helps you not have as dense, uh, wet, soggy bread. Instead, allows it to sort of steam out a little bit. Uh, it's also going to help it grow. Uh, with that hinge, it can open up more, and you're going to get a fluffier bread by slashing it this way. You can just as easily use a bread knife. Uh, these are nice, especially if you're baking a lot, uh, that you cut it about a 45 degree angle, about a quarter inch. Uh, you can cut it more to give yourself a little lip, like that little Mount Rushmore you guys saw, uh, or cut it less just to have it have slashes. Uh, cutting it at an angle is going to give you more of that lip. Uh, cutting it straight up and down is just going to give you sort of a bent space to go through. So a long is what we use for that. Um, People think it looks like both a cactus as an homage to these springs or a chicken foot. Ah, those are very different things from one another. Uh, chicken foot or cactus, people said. Pitchfork. We also have a pitchfork. <laughs> um, great. I think those are the really important tools. The other two things that I'll mention are uh, baking Sorry, tiles. A quick question about the. Does the, the, um, the yeah, long? Need, to be long, need to be serrated or just a regular knife? Uh, it can be just regular knife. just needs to be fairly sharp. So there are ones you can get that have a disposable razor, like old school safety razor blades that you can sort of swap in and out. Eventually these get dull and you just need to replace them, which is unfortunate. Um, regular knife is good, but the struggle is that, especially if you're working in the oven, getting a good angle uh, without cutting yourself or mangling your bread can be tough. Uh, so the other two big tools that are useful are a pizza stone or oven tiles. Um, pizza stone is basically just a piece of stone that you stick in your oven. It gets really hot. It's useful for getting a good crust because it's going to help cook the crust because it's gotten to the oven temperature. It's also going to be useful for helping your uh, oven stay at the same temperature. Every time you open and close your oven door, you, leave, you lose about 50 degrees of heat every 10 seconds you have it open. Uh, so having that sort of battery of lots of heat in your pizza stone, keeps the whole oven warmer and keeps it from being so buried with things. Uh, you can also use a Dutch oven. So a Dutch oven is sort of an enamel oven, uh, enamel pot. Uh, I bake in enamel pot like that. Uh, it's in the oven currently, but we'll show it to you in a little bit. Um, because you can put a lid on it and actually steam your bread that way. Steaming your bread is really useful because it gives you a sort of softer, more pliable crust. Uh, it's a really dry oven. You're going to get a very crunchy, crust, crusty crust. Uh, if you have a very, very damp oven, it's going to be very soft and maybe no crust at all. It's you know, a boiled bread, something like a bagel that doesn't really have a crust at all. Uh, so Dutch oven, really nice to have. If you don't have a Dutch oven, you can instead put moisture into your oven uh, just by putting ice cubes in like a pie dish and just letting them sort of melt and, and provide steam there. Anytime you're working with steam, be really careful taking off the lid to your Dutch oven. It's going to let out a, a puff of steam. That steam is coming from inside your bread and it's very quickly going to burn your face if you get too close. So be careful there. So those are the main tools I believe I suggested. At least they're the ones I laid out to talk. So now let's take a look back at the dough we started. Um, so we didn't go for the full 20 minutes, but we can start to look at what the auto lies has done. So when we first put it in there, it was totally just falling apart. And now we've got a little bit of stringiness to it, a little bit of pull. 
Uh, I am, at this point, going to add in the sourdough starter. And to clarify, that gets added after the auto -lessing. Correct. Uh, otherwise, the gluten starts, uh, the yeast starts sort of doing its magic uh, and eating up all the sugars, and you don't want it to start eating yet because you haven't yet done the kneading that you need to do. So I've just added that in there. I'm now going to dump it out so that you guys can see it and do a little bit of kneading by hand. Um, so kneading. Uh, the basic knead sort of springs from mixing. So mixing is just taking disparate ingredients and mixing them together, uh, getting them more uniform. First I'm mixing just to sort of get the sourdough into there. Um, and eventually I'm going to start kneading once we get to a sort of more stable dough. I'm going to add in the salt. Uh, that's going to help it sort of stiffen up a little bit. And you can see already we've gone from that really loose tacky uh, to having even more pulled just you know a minute and a half ago when I pulled this out. Uh, just by that little bit of kneading we've done. So the basic knead is clear this off the spoon. Um, the basic knead is just three steps in a row and repeated over and over again. These three steps are stretch, fold, turn. So you have your basic ball of dough, it's in sort of a lump. You're going to stretch it out until you now have this big the rectangle of dough. You're going to fold it in half, and then you're going to turn it. So you now got a ball that's 90 degrees from what it was before. You're going to stretch that out. You're going to fold it. You're going to turn it. You're going to stretch, fold, turn. Stretch, fold, turn. Stretch, fold, turn. And eventually, once you've done a lot of kneading, you sort of develop a technique that is going to not look like those individual shapes, but it's going to get you sort of that twisting motion. And that twisting motion is going to keep on pulling the gluten, but pulling it in different directions. So you're not just sort of constantly going in one way. There are different ways of uh, kneading that are a bit lazier. So if rather than doing a stretch full turn, you can just do a huge long stretch and get into a long strand and then fold it like that get it back and sort of stretch it out again. Uh, as it gets stronger, you'll get longer and longer strands that you can do. Uh, overall, I think it's really useful to learn how to do a good knead by hand uh, because, as I said, it's going to let you get to know your dough better. Uh, typically, I would go through this and knead the dough for about 10 minutes. Uh, the longer I can go, the more strength it's going to have to it. But let's take a look again at our gluten. So we had that really scrappy stuff. It now has much better pull to it. Uh, you can sort of stretch it out. If you're looking for a really nice rise on your bread, one thing you can do is after you've kneaded it, you can try and form what's called a gluten window, where you stretch out the gluten as thin as you can into this sort of square and then see when it rips. So here you can see you got a little rip up in that corner. Eventually, if you need it and you have strong enough gluten, you'll be able to stretch it so far that you can actually see through it. And it'll create a window where you can see color through it. Um, that's a good test. We will pretend as if we have just needed this for 10 minutes. And for the sake of the speediness of this class, we'll move on to the next step which we would take this and we would put it back in a bowl that's lightly oiled. Um, the light oil is going to be a good way to make sure it doesn't stick too much to the bowl. And then we'll lightly cover it. Uh, this is going to be the first rise. The first rise is going to last about two to three hours. And magically, here we are. Two to three hours later, uh, we've got this dough. Uh, this is dough I started before class, obviously. It's a little overproofed now um, because it's pretty warm in here because the oven's been on for five or six hours. Um, you can tell through its proof level by giving it what's called a poke test. Um, 
if you poke it and it immediately springs back, um, let's take a look. So this is the dough we were just working with. So if I poke it, you can see my fingerprint just disappears. Whereas if I poke this, my fingerprint sticks in it. Um, that's because it's sort of been blowing up. The yeast has been sort of filling those balloons that I created and blowing them up. At this point, a lot of recipes will tell you to punch down the dough. Uh, punch down the dough is a euphemism. Uh, you don't actually want to punch it. You've been spending so much time letting this yeast rise up. Uh, you want to be fairly gentle with it. You want to get a little bit of it, sort of knock around the yeast some. Um, but overall, you want to keep it as is. And we will do just a sort of light shaping at this point. So I'm going to make two balls of dough here. Um, and I can do that. This is a pretty wet dough. I'm just going to sort of fold it into itself to make a little pocket package here. Um, so you see that sort of scrappiness. I'm going to just pull along. We'll take the other one close up. Put a little bit of flour in your hands. So again, a flat piece. I haven't punched this down or deflated it too much. I'm just going to fold it into itself, create a nice little sort of purse and sort of tuck it in and let it sit. Um, normally, I would then let these little pockets of dough sit for 20 minutes. Um, one of the things I really love about sourdough is that there's a lot of waiting to it. Uh, it's a very meditative activity. You would lightly cover this, maybe put some plastic wrap, or oftentimes I'll just invert the bowl over it, sort of keep it so it doesn't dry out, so it doesn't get stuff in it. Let it sit for 20 minutes. Uh, this gives it time for the gluten to relax a little bit, for it to find its shape. It's going to make you have a, a stronger dough later. You don't want to waste your 20 minutes, so we'll just go straight to it right now and do a full shaping. So before, what you saw was doing a sort of basic shaping. Uh, now we're going to sort of shape it more tightly. And there are two ways you can do this. Um, the sort of easy way is just sort of to take the dough and just tuck it into itself. You're just sort of pulling it and pulling it. And you'll see that I'm just tucking into this little ball. And that is creating this nice sheath where I have this gluten that has formed this nice barrier wall all along the outside of it. And that you can get a fairly nice sort of rounded shape. Another way, sort of once you've figured out how to handle your dough, is to do what's called a stretch on the uh, countertop. And this I'm just using the friction of the countertop. So you can see I'm sort of pulling the bread against the countertop and I'm just rotating it as I go and sort of rotating along one axis to sort of keep pulling it and tucking it. And I use the back of my hand to sort of pull and then push it in. Let me see if I can do this from the other side. It's not left-handed. Um, and that's going to create a much tighter ball. So looking at these two side by side, the one that I just sort of tucked into itself, you can already see, uh, okay, you can already see that it's a little bit uh, slouchy, whereas this one has a much tighter angle to it. Um, at this point, I would take my proofing basket and add in some flour so it doesn't stick. And I will take my formed bread and place it face down into my proofing basket. My proofing basket, now this will be the bottom. As we said before, when I flip it out, this will be the bottom and the top will have those nice pretty marks on it. Now it's time for its next rise, its shaped rise. Uh, I would cover it again. Usually I'll put it in a plastic bag, just taking like a grocery produce bag, put it around this and let it sit. Um, I let it sit again to either the poke test or until I run out of time and it's time for bed. Uh, and then we stick it in the fridge. 
The fridge is an important component to sourdough because it's going to give you a chance to develop flavor. Uh, as we've talked about, you're going to be getting much more fluff and rise during the stage when it's out at room temperature. Once you stick it in the fridge, it's going to make the yeast sort of slow down and the bacteria sort of wake up. And the bacteria will start making those acids and alcohol that give you the complex flavors that you really like from sourdough bread. So uh, usually you'll want to let it sit overnight in the fridge. Um, so this is some bread that I started yesterday. Um, and it's been sitting overnight. And as you can see, I just put it in my new season bag. Um, and I'll take it out of that bag. And we can do a comparison. So this was the same recipe that we just did. And you can see in this, we're much smaller than this. We've gotten a fair amount of rise over the past 24 hours into this bread that we have here. So this is now, uh, I can give it a poke and see that the poke test, my fingerprint is coming back some. So this could actually rise for more time if we wanted to. It rise, sort of pushing back shows that it still has energy in it, but it's time to go. Uh, it's time for class. So we'll get this ready to bake. To bake this, what we're going to do is... Uh, a question about rising. Uh-huh. Uh, thought it had to be in a warm place to rise. Why put it in the fridge? So you're going to do... Uh, this is the one we just shaped. This I would let sit for three hours and rise in a warm place, room temperature, uh, in my house. And then I stick it in the fridge. So it has just gotten that rise of the... Um, carbon dioxide developing, and you stick it in the fridge because then it's going to change over to creating the acid and alcohol and give you the flavor. Putting in the fridge is a stage that you see most often in sourdough breads uh, because commercial yeast uh, doesn't have bacteria that's living in a symbiotic relationship with it. It's not a colony of all these little microorganisms. It's just that one type of yeast. That one type of yeast doesn't do anything special in the fridge. Uh, it doesn't produce any flavor. Only sticking sourdough in the fridge is going to get you a better flavor. Other questions? All right. So I have been preheating my Dutch oven. Um, so I'm going to take it out. And normally I would take this Dutch oven and put this straight in there. But so that you all can see the docking process, I'll put it out on the countertop first. So there's the dough. Um, and we will just take this and slashes. You know, you can be as consistent or inconsistent as you want. Oftentimes, bakers will talk about slashing the dough or docking, is what it's usually called. Technically, uh, it's their signature on their work of art. They've done something beautiful. Uh, so the big way I worked out, we had different patterns that we did for different types of bread. So you could see really easy visually that a crosshatch was walnut bread or a C was going to be or millet bread. Um, I oftentimes will just sort of start in one place and again at a sort of 45 degree angle I'm cutting in and you see I'm creating this little lip here. That lip is what's going to give you that nice rise uh, and give you that hat and you want to be somewhat consistent across the bread. Uh, if you only cut it in one place you're again going to get through that bulge in some place. Uh, you can see here I did sort of a C shape and then I crossed it again with a line. Um, now, the world is your oyster. You can do as you want. The more you cut it, uh, the more space it's going to have, but it's also going to dry out because it's being opened up to the world. Then I'm going to try and gently rock it and stick it straight into the Dutch oven here. Now the Dutch oven, I'm going to put its lid on there. Um, the lid's also been heating up in the oven. Now it's got this nice warm place. It's going to start baking right away. It won't stick to the Dutch oven because the Dutch oven's so hot 
that there's no sort of room in the Dutch oven for anything to stick to. And we have bake it for 20 minutes with the lid on. And then I'm gonna bake it for another 20 minutes with the lid off. As we said, this, the lid on creates a little sauna where it's gonna be producing all the steam that's coming out of that slash bar I just put is going to steam it up and it's gonna get that softer crust. If you want a really soft crust, you can leave the lid on for 30 minutes and then maybe you'll only take the lid off for the last 10. Um, once you get to that point, uh, you're going to get more browning from a lid off because it's gonna be that sort of hotter, drier heat. It's gonna let the milliard reaction and caramelization happen. You're gonna get a little bit lighter crust with the lid on, but it's gonna be softer. This can be balanced for what you want. If you don't have a Dutch oven, you can stick in, as I said, ice cubes into the bottom of the oven, give it a little bit of steam action, but always be careful there. So after 40 minutes uh, in the oven, uh, eventually I'm gonna take it out. Uh, you can stick a thermometer in it. Um, you need it to be up 200 or 210. You take the thermometer out and it's got go on it. That's a good sign that it isn't quite done yet. Um, then you let it cool. Uh, the cooling process, you wanna let it cool. What's the, the temperature of the oven? Uh, the oven is usually kind of as hot as you can get. Mine's 475 right now. Um, the hotter the oven, the sort of quicker it's gonna cook through. Uh, as long as it's not going to be too much direct heat in one place. And that's something that uh, if you have a pizza stone, it's going to help out. Like if you have an electric oven, the heating element heats up and it might burn through the bottom of like a metal sheet because metal conducts heat really well. Stone doesn't conduct heat all that well. It absorbs heat and maintains heat really well. So it'll get to the average temperature of the oven uh, rather than to the hottest part of the oven. Um, so uh, 450, 475 there. Um, then you take it out, let it cool. You don't let it cool on a rack. You let it cool straight on the countertop. Uh, it's gonna steam up as it cools down and that steaming is gonna give you a sort of gross gooey bottom crust. Uh, so let it steam on a rack. Once you're ready to go, um, you, I think it's really important. One of the tools I didn't talk about is having a good bread knife, uh, a sharp bread knife. It's always a shame when I see people who have made really wonderful bread and then they have a dull knife or they don't have a serrated knife and they just like crush it and mangle it. Um, so Allison is laughing because I don't let her cut bread anymore because she crushes it and mangles it. Um, so when you're cutting, you know, first be gentle and sort of let the teeth do some work until you've gotten a little bit of bite and then you can start applying pressure. Uh, then you can just saw through and get yourself a nice even slice. Um, and there we go. That beginning to end is all the ingredients, all the steps, and all the tools to make some sourdough bread. Uh, as you hopefully saw in the calendar invite, there's an attached document that's sort of a four page walkthrough to this recipe of sourdough bread. Uh, if you don't have your own sourdough starter, I'm happy to send you one. Um, I'll put it in the mail and it can arrive a couple days later. Uh, you can also start your own. I can put together some instructions for that if folks want to see what your own home tastes like, uh, see what the yeasts are that are living there, and get something going. We're 30 minutes longer than I promised, but I hope this has been everything you need to hear to know how to make good bread. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if there are questions that are in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to let people disappear on, on their merry way. We have a lot of thank yous, a lot of great classes. Thanks, y'all. Uh, we also have a curiosity about when you are going to have your show aired on cable. <laughs> uh, people will want to TiVo the next episode. Um, we also think you should post on TikTok. TikTok. Oh, um, I don't think a two-hour class can fit on TikTok, unfortunately. We have an inquiry about when people get to come over for bread. And unfortunately, <laughs> that is a very complex question. Um, but our hearts would let you come over, just not the, the world. <laughs> just not the quarantine. Yes. It, it's not going to let you come over. Um, and then also, how many bread injuries have you had over the course of your lifetime? <laughs> how many bread injuries? Uh, how many bread injuries? Uh, a very common bread injury for bakers 
is burn marks right here uh, from it's a little bit harder to do in a oven in a home, but in a commercial oven, if you're reaching in, you'll oftentimes hit the wire rack above and below and get these nice straight lines. Uh, so I've gotten those a fair number of times. Uh, I've cut myself with a serrated knife, uh, which is much worse than cutting yourself with a straight blade. Uh, so be careful there. Um, and I think the only other injury has just been <laughs> wear and tear. Uh, I really love baking and I thought for a little while about maybe going into baking as a profession, uh, but it's physically and psychologically difficult. You are breathing in flour dust, lifting heavy bags, doing repetitive motions on your feet all day. You're also just doing the same breads every day, day after day. One of the things I like about baking at home and baking for friends is I get that variety and get to give folks something new to try each time. A couple quick questions. Did you oil the Dutch oven first? I did not. So uh, one thing to sort of be aware of in general in cooking is that stainless steel, enamel, cast iron, any of them, uh, metal surface has little microscopic holes in it. Uh, and when it's warm, uh, it heats up and it expands in that heating. And it sort of fills in those holes. So if you start with a cold pan and you put food in a cold pan and then heat it, those holes will sort of close as it expands and they'll trap in whatever food you have. Whereas if you start with a hot pan and then add in food, you're gonna get a lot less sticking going on to that pan because all those little gaps have already sealed themselves. So enamel is specifically made not to have things stick to it. So something like a Dutch oven, uh, the bread really doesn't stick in there, especially with all the moisture that's going on from having the lid on. So I don't put any oil in there, mostly because the oil is gonna burn at that temperature. Uh, it's not gonna create any goodness in terms of helping the bread slide out at the end. It'll easily just sort of pop out once you, once you finish up. Um, <clears throat> will there be a recording that people can review? Uh, I did record it, and so hopefully this is still in process. And once we determine if it actually worked, we can post it and it can be available for review. Yep, I'll gladly, gladly share it around after I awkwardly watch it and see what's there. Um, we have another question. Uh, does it make a difference between cast iron Dutch oven or enamel? Uh, no, the only real difference is going to be if you have cast iron that's a well-seasoned cast iron. Um, it will harm the seasoning eventually uh, because it's just in a hot space for so long. Um, so I usually use an enamel one for the sake of my cast iron. Uh, but yeah, you can go either way. And then confirming that we did not use a pizza stone in addition to a Dutch oven. It just goes on our rack. Correct. Uh, I just put it straight on the rack, didn't put it on a pizza stone. You can, it won't do any harm to put it on a pizza stone. Um, it'll just, uh, it's an extra piece of stuff to have in your oven at any given time. And then when is the next baked good lesson? Uh, there are no other lessons Planned. I used to teach this as sort of a 101 and then at a 102, which was enriched bread. So breads that have uh, dairy and butter and eggs in them. Um, that one, so much the fun was being in person and getting to do it. Uh, maybe, depending on how long we're trapped in here, I'll, I'll bring that back and we can talk, talk enriched breads. But lots of thank yous on the chat and we will figure out how to I will be saving that for Nathan so he can read it. Great. Thank you. Uh, as I said in the invite, uh, if you have an opportunity to give, uh, please do to your local food bank. Put bread on somebody else's table. Uh, check my phone. It looks like we got around $200 uh, towards the Oregon Food Bank, uh, which will get matched, which will be wonderful. Uh, feel free to Venmo me, uh, nathan Leamy, and we'll get it matched or make donations yourself. Or Venmo Allison if you have her stuff and not my stuff. Um, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes. People have questions, but uh, otherwise, I release you to the world. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for, for hearing all about bread and happy baking. Good job.
So no more questions coming in yet. Um, Lots of good thank yous. Question. Do you have a store you prefer to buy bread baking supplies from? Um, I usually buy most of my stuff locally to support local stores. Uh, in Portland, Kitchen Caboodle is right down the street from me, and I buy a lot of things from them. Um, in particular, I don't have a specific person who I'd say is the best bread baking store. Um, Breadtopia is a really good website for bread related questions and issues. Uh, Breadtopia? Breadtopia, like utopia plus bread. Uh, and they also have a, a store that's available too. I'm gonna put everyone in gallery view for the people who left still. So. Any other questions? Um. Well, all right, we'll call it a night. Happy baking. Uh, I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in person in the near future. And thanks to my lovely producer, Allison. Yay, thank you work. guys. That was really fun for me too. <laughs> <laughs> so much good dancing. Doing the bread dance. Bye guys, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>